Ladies and gentlemen, I heartily want to welcome uh, all of you to our today's event with the title The War in Ukraine and its Consequences. And it's a great pleasure for me to welcome you. Some prominent guests, I just want to uh, utter my, my uh, pleasure that I can see uh, the Slovak ambassador Peter Misik, Herr Botschafter, Herr General, uh, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great pleasure to have you here. We have quite a compact program, and therefore I will try to be uh, very short. Uh, a big program because we will start with an online comment of uh, the Austrian commentator uh, of our broadcasting union, the the man who is present in Ukraine, so we will get a picture. And afterwards, uh, we will start the row, and afterwards I also uh, will try to pre present our speakers. And insofar, if we are ready, I would say, let's start. Not ready yet. Ah, uh -huh, okay. Not at all? Ah, uh -huh. some problems? Okay, uh, one can foresee it. Then I would like... Uh, to present you our today's speakers. As I said, Christian Werschitz, uh, everybody in Austria is knowing him because, of course, there's no day uh, without a comment on TV uh, from his side. Uh, he is especially important in, in this situation because he has not only studied law, and, of course, he is an uh, outstanding journalist, but he also has... Uh, and career as officer, as military officer, and therefore his understanding of what is going on uh, is extremely important. Okay, afterwards we will start uh, with a man that probably many of uh, this auditory will know or have met already. This is Mikulas Churinda. Mikulas Churinda is a former Prime Minister, Foreign Minister, Transport Minister in Slovakia. And so many people in Austria know that he uh, is the one that really was the decisive factor that Slovakia managed to join EU and NATO in the same group with uh, Czech Republic, Hungary uh, and, and Poland. And this certainly was not easy then because... Uh, there was quite a few challenges you had to overcome. Uh, he also was a foreign minister. And insofar, uh, we are really interested because of his present function as the president of Wilfred Martin's Center in Brussels, of course, makes him uh, a decisive uh, personality also in European politics because the Wilfred Martin Center is the think tank of uh, the biggest political group uh, in European Parliament, uh, the uh, European People's Party. Hartley, welcome to you. Uh, I immediately uh, go on. At your left side, I can see uh, Peter Stare. Peter Stare comes from Hungary. Uh, he has studied international law in Hungary, uh, but also uh, he went to diplomatic academy here in Vienna so far. He has come home, and we are really pleased that you did take this opportunity because everybody knows in a few days there will be elections in Hungary, and so you can imagine that even if he is a career diplomat with many functions, uh, he used to be uh, ambassador to NATO and EU uh, in, uh, for Hungary. He used to be the political director uh, in the Hungarian uh, in the Hungarian Foreign Ministry and so on. Uh, and now he's the State Secretary uh, for, uh, for Foreign Affairs uh, and Trade, and I think this is quite important. Yeah, uh, uh, to my left now, I want to welcome uh, Christian Diaconescu. Uh, he also has an outstanding uh, career because he used to be not only uh, 
an outstanding diplomat and a professor. He is teaching international, he's a professor teaching international law. Uh, he uh, served as an ambassador, but also he used to be member of the Senate in Romania and even one of the vice presidents of the Senate, and he used to be uh, foreign minister of Romania twice. Insofar, it's a great pleasure. And if we think, you know, uh, how close Romania is situated, uh, this certainly is of quite some interest for us. We chose this group, you know, because we thought uh, we should have a, a look from the southwestern side of Ukraine. Uh, what are the neighbors uh, watching? What are they thinking of? Uh, what are their experiences? What are their hopes, but also what are their fears? And what do you think will be the outcome? Yeah, then we, have, we will have Vadim Pistrinchuk. Uh, he also should be uh, online because he could not manage to take the flight from Moldova. We would have been very interested uh, for him to come, unfortunately. Uh, today, this was not possible so far. I hope we will have the opportunity. And last but not least will be the former ambassador and special representative in many functions. Uh, Martin Seidig used to be uh, or had an outstanding career in private industry. He started out uh, also in this building, but not at Diplomatic Academy, but at the Teresianum. Uh, he was a private manager for a bank and also for a construction company in Moscow. Then he became a diplomat, served in Moscow, uh, but also uh, in, in Beijing as ambassador at the United Nations as ambassador. And the last years he spent as the special representative uh, for OSCE in Ukraine. And insofar, uh, he certainly is or probably is the one who is very, very close to all uh, the discussed matters we are confronted now. Okay, uh, I guess, aha, uh -huh. yeah, we can see already. Uh, Christian Werschütz, herzlich willkommen. Es ist eine Freude, it is a great pleasure uh, to look at you. And okay, I make it very short. I, tried to introduce you already shortly. Uh, everybody is looking forward to your comment. Please tell us a little bit, where does Ukraine stand at the moment? What is the actual uh, questions that are discussed? I'm, I'm, I'm currently, uh, we arrived um, very shortly, uh, we arrived in Saporizhia. Uh, this is a city uh, on the Dnieper and it's relatively close now today already to the front line. And I must say, uh, you have no shootings or something like this or no alert. But uh, what you really see if you look at the city is unbelievable because it's like a ghost town. And this is something which is really terrible because uh, you have the impression... Each shop in the center is closed without, because without, without some grocery shops for, for, for products. Um, you have almost no traffic in, in this town. And uh, you are really feeling the result of this uncertainty. Mostly, most likely a lot of people have left. We will meet the mayor tomorrow. So this is the first general impression. Uh, second, we went today in Dnipropetrovsk, we did an interview with the mayor, we did an interview with an entrepreneur, and um, I would say before talking about the war, I would like to talk about some humanitarian questions. I have seen so many uh, um, humanitarian convoys with, with, with uh, hygienics, with pampers, with all this kind of stuff. Um, today we filmed um, uh, at the largest factory in Dnipropetrovsk, which is producing um, uh, these uh, stimpers, uh, like of pampers, uh, a lot of hygienics. And I'm still asking myself, okay, um, why we do not help them simply uh, uh, in producing more than delivering this so we could strengthen a little bit at least the local economy. Second, what I would say is still important in this issue we have also to have a look for which kind of help we will deliver. What this country need is a Marshall Plan before the Marshall Plan. Uh, 
Because, I mean, if I'm talking to entrepreneurs, we were talking to a product, um, a, a, an entrepreneur who is producing agricultural uh, products with 120,000 hectares, 100,000 of occupied territory. He told me, look, until June, uh, we can survive, but then we'll, we'll have to go to the banks. So there must be also a kind of plan what we can do with entrepreneurs, which uh, are very important, very critical for the country, but where they have really problems. What can we, how we can help them? This is also the guy, uh, the man I have met today producing these hygienics. Um, uh, he needs spare parts from Austrian companies, but there are problems to get these spare parts because of the banking system, of, of other things. So there we should really think about how with international guarantees we can help these entrepreneurs because both, uh, for example, are employing 2,500 people. This is a general situation, I would say, first, which is important. Secondly, look, um, I have seen the negotiations uh, yesterday, today on the internet, the 10 points of Ukraine were published, which were uh, delivered to, to Moscow. Um, first of all, I think what we face in the Kiev region is a regrouping of, uh, of the forces and we do not see any serious attempt of a ceasefire. I think uh, we will have a kind of grace period now of some days, maybe, but if the Russians are ready to attack from the south and from the east and the northeast, then uh, we will face these attacks at least until uh, Russia has reached the former lines, uh, former borders of, of the oblasts of, of Donetsk and Lugansk. And if you look at the proposals of Ukraine, then you really must ask the question um, how you want to implement this because um, I do not talk now about the guarantees for borders uh, which kind of borders this country will have but uh, maybe Martin Seidig will be able to say much more about it but uh, which kind of security guarantees Ukraine can get and how long negotiations will last for securities where Ukraine wants security guarantees from Germany from all other countries uh, from a lot of other countries in Europe. Uh, this is not something you can negotiate between uh, Russia and Ukraine. So personally, my, my impression is that the war will go on uh, because um, in, the, in, the, in the mean of Clausewitz, we have not uh, reached until now the so-called culminating point uh, of the war where both sides should be interested at least in, in, a, in a kind of, of peace agreement or any kind of ceasefire. Because uh, if you look at the situation that Russia is demanding, uh, that Ukraine is offering neutrality, uh, not becoming a member of NATO, where it's clear that NATO would not accept Ukraine's membership. So the question is, did uh, Russia really wage this war only uh, for these things? Or what is the status of Crimea? What would be the status of the water supply of Crimea? So in all these things, um, we really see um, a lot of questions. I want finally uh, to talk about two more issues. Even if there will be a ceasefire, or even if this war will not last longer until uh, June or July, uh, the consequences for Ukraine will be extremely severe. Who will rebuild uh, all these houses? Who will rebuild Mariupol if Mariupol will have access to, to, to Ukraine, if it's not becoming a part of the so-called Donetsk People's Republic? And the main question is how Ukraine will be able to export goods. 98% um, of, of grain um, of Ukraine was shipped by three ports, Odessa, Mykolaiv, and Mariupol. Mariupol less important, but Odessa and Mykolaiv. Both ports are not um, able to, to export anything because of the war and also the sea mines you have uh, in the Black Sea. So how Ukraine can recover? It is impossible to substitute these ports uh, with, with railways. Because uh, you have only one point where you can change this, uh, this rails um, uh, from the Russian uh, uh, dimension to the to the Central and uh, um, European dimension. I mean, these are things where we really have to think about and about the consequences if Ukraine will not be able to export grain. 
countries like Yemen and others are mainly countries who have uh, imported grain from, from European Union. So what we will face here. So in this way, the consequences are extremely severe. The consequences are felt uh, almost every day because you see people leaving. You have the question who will return, how they will be able to return. So I think this is something, this war is putting the whole international order, at least in European security order, completely upside down. Uh, and um, it is clear that the country which is uh, losing most is, is Ukraine, but I'm a journalist and not a politician, so I do not see any strategy now for a fast track a way out of this situation. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Uh, really was a great pleasure. Yeah, applause. <laughs> not only thank you, but also good luck for everything you are doing. We know how difficult it is, how responsible your business is, but also how dangerous it can be. And insofar, thank you so much for your information. Before we proceed, I just wanted to ask uh, General Segur Kavanagh to come into the first row and also our board member and chief uh, economic advisor, Dr. Huber, please come into the first row. Uh, we should not have empty places in the first row. <laughs> Go into the middle, please, <clears throat> okay. Uh, and Peter Heider, you too, please. Okay. Uh, I guess we need you, of course, and we need your advice, you know, not only militarily, but also economically. And before I give the word, you know, uh, to Premier Nicolas Churinda, uh, maybe a few words from my side. This catastrophe. Was it foreseeable or not? Most of the Europeans did not expect it. You could see the Americans obviously had better information. But what we can say already now is that practically everybody lost. This is a lose, 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 lose situation. I mean that Ukraine has lost, is without any discussion. I do not have to go into this catastrophe. But also Russia has lost. It has lost already this war, politically at least. It has self-isolated the country and more or less taken it out of the European game, of the European political game for quite some time. Putin's dream, maybe, to bring back uh, the cave monasteries of Kiev uh, to the Patriarch of uh, Moscow, maybe could end in uh, a reputation of his personality in Russian history, that he has not been a big uh, unifier, but maybe he is the one who has made Russia a Chinese vessel. If we look, you know, to the question, has Europe won? Of course, you can talk that maybe some organization has uh, got some profile like NATO or whatever. But just look at Europe. Our biggest neighbor of European Union, by far the biggest and most important is Russia. And when Russia is separated, of course, Europe has lost. And the same, the whole world has lost. If you look, you know, to the situation, if, uh, if you look to United Nations, I mean, when one of the permanent members of Security Council makes an invasion into one of the founding members of United Nations, and just with pure military power, then you can see, okay, that our global system, of course, has got quite some damage. And insofar, I think, you know, that uh, it will be necessary really to go into the depth. And this 
question <clears throat> will occupy us uh, for quite some time, not only what is going on at the moment, but also what will be the consequences in the long run. Is it a victory already of, uh, I don't know, emotional uh, politics? Uh, is it the end of a period of high rationality? Uh, what is it? I mean, okay. And we will try, you know, to find a few answers. Nobody can give you the answer at the moment. Nobody know, is knowing what <coughs> will be the outcome in three weeks or in three months, of course. But we will try, you know, to get deeper into the, uh, the challenges. And insofar, it is really my great pleasure uh, to ask as our, our first presenter, Mikolas Cerinda. He has such an experience in politics and he uh, knows so much. I, I, also from a Slovak position, you know, uh, people that are very close to the Ukrainian people, also to the Russian people uh, in, in, in the past, Insofar, it really will be highly interesting for us. How do you see the situation, mm -hmm. uh, Prime Minister Cerinda? Thank you very much, Mr. Minister, Minister of Defense. Dear Werner, dear friends, ladies and gent gentlemen, uh, thank you very much for this opportunity. It is always a pleasure to come to Vienna and to talk to you in this beautiful house. Look, uh, uh, <clears throat> the background of my thinking is uh, influenced by two elements. The first, as you uh, have mentioned, this is uh, my knowledge of the terrain. I speak Russian. I was uh, uh, growing in time when it was an obligation to learn a Russian language. And I had the privilege to meet with Mr. Putin, Putin several times. I remember when uh, President Bush met with Putin in Bratislava. It was more or less the, the same time, the end of February 2005. <clears throat> so I had really five, six, seven, eight possibilities to talk to him vis-a-vis. -vis. Uh, having realized how emotional he is, by the way. And on the other side, um, in this uh, last position as the head of this political think tank, think tank of the <coughs> European People's Party, we had a special program in Ukraine. Immediately after the revolution of dignity, since December 2014 till 2019, we operated in Ukraine with a special program, Ukraine Reforms. We uh, sent a number of former prime ministers finance ministers, defense ministers, but also experts, and not only to Kyiv, but also to Dnipro, Kharkiv, Lviv, Vinitsia, um, and many other places, in order to share experience <coughs> from our reforms, to help the country to go through this difficult period of time. So I know very well how Ukrainians uh, did uh, their reforms and changes, and believe me, they did a lot, also militarily. I visited twice the line of contact, visiting Dnipro and many other places. <clears throat> and the army, Ukrainian army today, is completely different than 10 years ago. So if I um, take together these two tendencies or knowledges, my experience with the Russians or Kremlin or Putin, and my experience with Ukraine, I would say that we should be ready for a long journey. Not for a question of few weeks or months, but internally, psychologically, mentally, and politically, I am preparing myself for a long journey. The resistance of Ukraine is and will be very strong, believe me, also military resistance. Uh, Putin, apart from other things, succeeded in this respect that now we have very homogeneous political Ukrainian nation. This is uh, the case of the, of the past that we had the East and the West. Forget <laughs> it. I was in Kharki for three days and believe me, everybody speaks English at the university. Everybody now, now 
Ukraine and the, the, the countries united. Having said this, it is clear for me that we <coughs> should be ready that it will, long, it will take long and we will pay. Werner it is not popular. I like good messages, not bad messages. But bad news, realistic news is that the consequences, the title of the conference is the consequences. The consequences are and will be very high and not, not, not nice. Human lives. A lot of casualties on both sides. And then money. A humanitarian aid. The consequences of economic sanctions. Uh, arms deliveries. And uh, taking care of, of refugees. Everything is and will be very costly. Let's hope the day will come when recovery will be needed and possible. Another money. Marshall Plan, as the gentleman had already mentioned. And this money will be paid mostly by us, but by Europeans, due to the logical reason. So the consequence, I expect that the consequences will be high and it will be, it, it will be difficult. We in Slovakia, we like to say there is a proverb that, that uh, everything bad comes with something good. Good news for me is this reality, which, which uh, has already been mentioned, that the neighbor in these days is a friendly and democratic country. Ukraine has decided to belong to the West. And I have a lot of experience with these people. I believe that this decision is sustainable, and, uh, irreversible, and the country will follow this direction. And the second good news by uh, my mind is that uh, Putin and Kremlin helped us to be united again inside the EU, but also across the transatlantic. It was Biden's administration that uh, helped <coughs> our German friends to understand that the Nord Stream 2 pipeline is not sustainable anymore. And also when it comes to sanctions, economic sanctions, personal sanctions. The US administration uh, helped us a lot to be united and to speak with one voice, which is, which is not something neglectable. But the most important consequence in my head is the change uh, in the geopolitical landscape. You said rightly, Werner, that this is lose, 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 lose event. Absolutely. But when I was listening to you, I realized that either we want or not, there is one winner and will be one winner. China. China is carefully watching, waiting. Some other countries as well, India and the others. We know the result of the vote in the United Nations. So uh, China is, is waiting. China is waiting and playing uh, an ambiguous game uh, because it is very advantageous what happens uh, in, uh, in Ukraine. And in this respect, I'd like to share with you one concern which I feel very strongly. Um, well, all eyes are on Ukraine in these days, which is very natural. But what I miss is a substantial discussion inside the European family about our European defense. Last week, we had three great events in Brussels, EU summit, NATO summit, summit, G7 summit. But you can read in the conclusions only about the need to invest more in defense. But what I advocate strongly, and Werner don't knows that, and many people, I believe that I had also, I, as, as, I delivered such, such speech also in this house that we need <coughs> to go further with our European de defense to create something like integrated European defense forces. It is time to come. It is time to deliver. Otherwise, we still are not able to be operational enough and to enjoy uh, respect and authority. And I know Putin. Putin loves Weak people, weak countries, weak defense. He's afraid if you are strong. 
So this time is really right to undertake courageous decision and to create a common European forces. I am a Christian Democrat, and I strongly believe in subsidiarity principle. By subsidiarity principle, I strongly believe that there are areas which should stay at the national competence. But foreign policy issue, defense, security, no country can act on its own. Only together, under a common European command, we can enjoy respect authority and our forces can serve as a real hard deterrence which is needed in these days. So it is, it is very special time. We need to change our, let's say, strategic culture. I was taught for many years that to build defense, to invest, uh, to, inv uh, to invest into defense, it is not in line with our long time strategic European culture. But this is something like a wake up call, what is happening now uh, in Ukraine and beyond. And maybe last uh, point uh, at the beginning, I'd like to mention also another danger which I feel, uh, and also my Ukrainian friends, I met two deputies from Verkhovna Rada this morning from the Parliament of Ukraine in Bratislava, two ladies. Mm -hmm. And this is something which can be described as Ukraine fatigue. Ukraine fatigue. Sooner or later, we are afraid that uh, uh, it can happen because we have some experience with Crimea, with annexation, we have some experience with Luhansk and Donetsk, and after several weeks and months, we took the issue as granted. Yeah, Crimea belongs to Russia, it is done, Luhansk and Donetsk we will see. So there is a danger that uh, it can happen also uh, with respect of the current develop development in Ukraine. Uh, so, in my eyes, this is maybe, maybe, maybe everything, because I, I have a look at, at the clock. Maybe in the, in the debate we can go deeper in some particular issues. Everything is important in these days. To help Ukraine, to provide Ukraine with uh, human, humanitarian uh, help, uh, with arms deliveries. I am a man who can understand that we should be careful. There are the red lines, and I agree with that. But on the other hand, I was very unhappy when the Poland wanted to provide Ukraine with all the Russian fighters in cooperation with the United States, but the US was hesitating. So it was not good. We should be mo more courageous. All these things are everything to help Ukraine as much as we can. But Let's remember geopolitics. Huge changes, big shift in this scale, and sooner or later, US will be very busy with China. It, 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 it is already busy with China, and we as Europeans should understand and uh, adopt all necessary measures, especially when it comes to our European defense. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I <coughs> immediately would like to go to Peter Stare. Uh, we are looking forward to listen to a Hungarian uh, position and also to a position from a man who has quite some experience also with NATO, uh, with defense questions and so on. Please, Mr. Thank State you. Secretary. Thank you very much. And it's a great privilege and honor to be back uh, to the Academy. and. Uh, to be part of this panel. I, I wasn't in this building for 30 years. Oh, really? <laughs> but I have some nice experience about uh, exercising Walza here in this very room. So all the good memories are here. But why we gathered today is, of course, a very serious subject. So I don't want to make uh, further jokes. And uh, if I want to compress uh, the whole thing in, in one sentence, then I would say that we are witnessing uh, very dark days of European history. <clears throat> And uh, we, uh, countries uh, of Central Europe, uh, neighboring countries to Ukraine, uh, all are very concerned about what's going on in our neighborhood. Uh, because uh, actually, 
what happened is that one OSC member state uh, attacked a neighboring OSC, sovereign OSC member state uh, in a huge military campaign. So this is uh, military aggression against another country. <clears throat> and one could put the question, is this the end of the Helsinki system? I think uh, we are very close to that. We are very close to that and we will have to think about uh, how we can proceed from this point and I will come back to that in my conclusions. But first I'd like to say a few words about where we are now. Uh, we all hope that diplomacy uh, can be successful. There were many talks with, in many different formats, bilaterally and multilaterally, and uh, we hope that this could uh, have some kind of uh, result, positive result, but this was not the case. And in the present assessment, uh, it seems that uh, this uh, invasion is going on. Uh, Ukraine is uh, fighting back very hard. I mean, uh, Ukrainian uh, uh, patriotism seems to be very strong, and they also get uh, significant uh, support from the West, from their uh, friends. Uh, we don't see the strategic end goal of the Russian Federation in this campaign. <coughs> uh, but it seems that Russia is uh, trying to e extend its influence uh, towards uh, Crimea, creating a ground corridor, land corridor to Crimea. Uh, there are also uh, operations in the south, so it may occupy uh, the seashore of the Black Sea, and uh, Russia may have an appetite for a land connection with uh, Transnistria. So there are many possible uh, scenarios, and it's very early to say but, uh, but none of these scenarios are, are, are good scenarios, and none of these scenarios are, of course, acceptable legally or morally. Uh, I think when we talk about the reaction of the international community, then I think we can say that some of the organizations uh, responded or gave a very firm and very tough response. Uh, in that uh, respect, the EU is one of the key players, because uh, just in a couple of few days' time, the EU uh, join, uh, reached consensus on very tough sanctions uh, covering persons, sectors and entities. <clears throat> uh, it targeted the uh, SWIFT uh, system. Uh, Russia was excluded from uh, the European airspace and uh, uh, the European Union opened the European Peace Facility. Two times 500 million euros are ready to be spent for uh, uh, military equipment to be donated to Ukraine, which is a very significant uh, uh, assistance. Uh, so these targeted measures are, of course, uh, hitting the Russian Federation already. And uh, also, we supported a, a symbolic thing, which is uh, supporting a quick candidate status for Ukraine in its path uh, uh, for uh, the accession to the European Union. Energy is one of the problematic uh, issues. Uh, there are exceptions. Some countries, like Hungary, has a, a vital national interest in uh, keeping that uh, sector, at least for the time being, out uh, of, uh, uh, of the different sanctions, because, of course, we cannot <coughs> Uh, heat uh, with sanctions. We, we need to find some solutions and uh, we need to find diversification, but that doesn't uh, take only one day, that will take a bit more. So, uh, NATO, NATO was very cautious and very determined, uh, and I think that's very important strategically, because uh, NATO has the power, but NATO has to be wise uh, and not get involved directly in this conflict. So. I think the necessary decisions were made in the first few days of the crisis. Actually, uh, we transferred authority to SACUR, to the European commander uh, of NATO, and uh, SACUR decided uh, to reinforce the eastern flank of NATO. So in that respect, uh, again, uh, <clears throat> I think we made some very important decisions. Slovakia, Romania, Bulgaria, Hungary, we are all reinforced now uh, by uh, multinational <clears throat> uh, uh, battle groups. Uh, but there are also limits. This is clearly not an Article 5 uh, situation. Uh, Ukraine is not a NATO member, so NATO has to be cautious on that. Uh, the proposals for a possible no-fly zone or for some kind of peacekeeping uh, arrangement 
are not ripe enough because uh, they could lead to further escalation and the direct confrontation between NATO and uh, Russia. So we have to avoid that situation. <clears throat> and the summit, of course, decided about these limits, but at the same time gave a very clear support for Ukraine and uh, strengthened the position of uh, uh, supporting Ukraine's uh, sovereignty and territorial integrity. In other organizations, of course, it's more problematic because, for example, in the UN General Assembly, we could pass some decisions, but uh, in the UN Security Council, it was impossible uh, to make any movement. Sorry, I just have a call. I just check what is my minister because then I have to leave the room <laughs> for a few minutes, but it's not him. Uh, not your uh, wife. <laughs> he's very active, so I, I have to be prepared 24 slash 24. Uh, so, uh, in the UN Security Council, of course, it's lame because there is Russia and China and they are not supporting any decisions with regard to this. But the Council of Europe made a decision uh, and we excluded Russia, which is a very tough decision. And there are also disadvantages regarding this because uh, we cannot maintain now the channels in this very important pan-European human rights uh, uh, organization. And, of course, in the OSC, again, there's a very different situation here in Vienna because Russia is a member state and Russia, together with Belarus, is opposing some decisions. But at least there is a channel, there's a forum to debate the issues, so maybe this could help. I hope that the OSC can overcome its present crisis and, and there can be a, a, a constructive uh, kind of discussion. Uh, there's a very serious refugee crisis. I'm not going into details because we don't have time, but uh, like others uh, in this room, uh, Hungary too is hit by a big flow. More than 650,000 people entered either through the Ukrainian-Hungarian border or from the east, from Moldova, uh, Romania. Many of them continue their journey towards uh, the west, uh, including Austria. But many will stay, uh, and we have to handle this situation. I think until now, uh, the government and the different charity organizations were able to do so. I also visited uh, the Ukrainian border two weeks ago with Mr. Uh, uh, with your uh, uh, alt uh, uh, vice chancellor, Mr. Spindelega, and uh, we had an impression that everything is very well organized. But there is a serious thing that people continue to come and we have to accommodate them, and we have to organize <clears throat> their social situation and give them uh, support. <clears throat> uh, I gathered a couple of points about the possible geopolitical consequences. Of course, it's a bit too early to talk about midterm uh, consequences, but maybe we already see some issues, as it was uh, mentioned by, by Mikulaj. Uh, uh, I see also some of these things that he mentioned. So, the end of the Helsinki system, what kind of European security architecture can be built after this? I think this will take a long time, I agree with that. Something new has to come, but we don't know what it will be like. Uh, we are still in the hot phase of this uh, war, and uh, before uh, this hot, hot phase is, uh, uh, comes to an end, uh, nobody uh, can think about new architecture or any new solutions. <clears throat> And in a way, Russia excluded itself for a long time from this kind of traditional multilateralism or um, those relations that uh, were set up, uh, the structures were set up uh, after the Cold War, basically. Uh, the sanctions will weaken Russia's economy. They are already functioning. And this will have an impact on uh, Russia's uh, society, uh, on the middle class, on the oligarchs, uh, this will have uh, uh, far-reaching repercussions. I also think that uh, we need to keep some channels open towards uh, Moscow, because Russia will stay with us, as you said. Uh, Russia will stay a big power, and we need some kind of communication uh, for the future. So Hungary especially is interested in that, because we know that whenever uh, there is such a conflict uh, between East and West, this all, always goes to the detriment of our countries in Central Europe. So this is not our interest. But the way how we will do that, I don't know yet. I'm very frank. <clears throat> now, in the transatlantic link, there is also a result. I think the transatlantic link has been reinforced in the past uh, six weeks. Uh, NATO has strengthened itself. NATO has strengthened its uh, eastern flank again. Uh, so. Uh, I think that uh, Russia's purpose was not this, but actually 
uh, we reached a very strong consensus on our decisions and uh, we sent uh, capacities, uh, uh, troops to the Baltic states, to Poland and also to the countries that I mentioned uh, before. So NATO is stronger than it was two months ago. And the defensive posture of NATO is stronger, which is very important because that's the only way how you can assure credible deterrence under the Washington Treaty. <clears throat> I also think that Europe is more united than it was. Uh, we joined all the different decisions, statements and sanctions together. We decided together and uh, my conviction is that Europe became much stronger. And I also think that uh, the voices in favor of a stronger European defense uh, and military capabilities have become stronger. Because this is one of the side effects of this whole uh, crisis situation. And the question of strategic autonomy or more uh, strategic uh, operational capabilities uh, will become a very important discussion point in the coming uh, months and years. There's another subject which is a midterm effect, that is uh, energy security. Uh, we have done a lot in the past 30 years for diversification, but we are still very much exposed to Russian supplies, at least some of our countries. But now this process is being uh, uh, accelerated. <clears throat> and uh, there are different proposals how we can do that. There are also objective limits on this. You cannot do that overnight, uh, but I think uh, the political idea of uh, the necessity of diversification is much stronger now than it was before the outbreak of the war. Another interesting consequence uh, is that uh, the former Soviet republics, uh, except the three Baltic states, I think received uh, a very strong message from Moscow that there are limits, there are, uh, there's limited room for maneuver in choosing uh, their foreign policy uh, orientation. And this is a, very tough to say so. But I think uh, that is one of the side effects of this present crisis, that uh, other <clears throat> uh, countries who were part of the Soviet Union uh, uh, may have problems if they want to change uh, their foreign policy orientation. Uh, another consequence is that the use of force that we thought uh, already we left behind as a possible tool of conflict management has uh, come back uh, as a possible tool. And I think that's a very bad consequence uh, of the crisis because the whole Helsinki system and the whole idea after uh, the fall of the Berlin Wall was based on the peaceful solution of, of, of conflicts. And now uh, maybe there are other countries, uh, even globally or in the world, who, uh, who have a, a new idea that, that maybe the use of force is a possible way of, of uh, settling conflicts. And I think that's a bad consequence. Uh, the idea of effective multilateralism, this is related uh, to the previous thing, I mean, the, the use of force. So multilateralism uh, uh, is really uh, su uh, suffering a serious setback because we were believing all the time in our institutions and now we see that when a real crisis comes, then the institutions cannot prevent uh, such a crisis or such a war uh, and things happen either bilaterally or unilaterally. And this is a very bad, uh, bad, bad uh, consequence. I don't see how and how much time it would take to rebuild these uh, institutions <clears throat> and to make them genuine and make them credible again, where we can make decisions together and where we can trust each other that we will implement those decisions that we take together. Uh, there's int an interesting uh, consequence, which is the German decision on rearming uh, the Bundeswehr with 100 billion euros. If, if you look at this sum, it's a huge sum. I think uh, if uh, Germany implements this decision, and uh, I see that they are committed to the implementation of this decision, this will have a, a, a very serious impact on uh, uh, the balance structure within Europe. And I, I, I don't want to say anything with that, any negative thing, but I, I'm just saying that this will have an impact on European defense and it will have an impact on the balance of power within the European Union. Uh, another consequence, which we don't talk too much about, but I think it's important because it has a mid-term effect on Europe, Europe's security and stability, is that uh, attention vis-a-vis -vis the southern challenges, so-called so southern challenges, is uh, actually decreasing 
So we don't talk too much about the Sahel, Africa, uh, Mali, about uh, terrorism there, about migration and the possible impacts of, of these things. Although a lot is happening in the region, a lot is happening in Africa, actually also very negative things. We, we just had to leave Mali with the Takuba mission together with the French because the Malian government said that we have to leave. Uh, terrorism is increasing, the level of terrorism. People will leave, there will be a food crisis probably, not only because of terrorism, but also because of the Ukrainian crisis. So there are lots of different aspects which, uh, which tell us that uh, the crisis in Africa may deepen and that will have an impact on uh, our security too. Uh, there's another consequence which is the impact on global economy, which was mentioned the possible food crisis, the possible crisis with the prices of food and of energy, and the uh, cumulated effect of all these different aspects. And if this comes, this will be a real challenge to our governments and to our people, to our societies. So I think we have to do a lot of work in the European Union and in other OECD and in other organizations to be prepared for these secondary consequences that we may face in the future. And finally, again, which was mentioned by, by, by Mikulash, is uh, the Chinese factor. Uh, my assessment is the same. China will come out uh, from uh, this present crisis uh, even stronger. Its impact, its influence globally will increase uh, with this uh, present uh, crisis. And we will see what this will mean for the uh, uh, world of international cooperation. And I'm not going into the special Hungarian uh, aspects now, but if there are questions, uh, I'm ready to talk about it. Thank you very much. In a nutshell, and really shortening my prepared introduction, this is what I wanted uh, to share with you. Thank you. <clears throat> well, thank you very much for your very uh, comprehensive and professional analysis about uh, consequences. Uh, and, okay, there is a huge list of consequences we will be confronted with. Uh, we probably only can get part out of it uh, or see it at, at least, and uh, the whole development maybe will be much bigger than we think at the moment. Insofar, I would like now to go to our next presenter. Uh, we have two countries two EU members uh, that are neighboring the Black Sea. This is Romania this is and Bulgaria. Uh, and of course, uh, therefore, screened? the Romanian position, <clears throat> which has also traditionally uh, some fleet at uh, the Black Sea, uh, will be highly interesting. And of course, also this neighborhood to Moldova, a neighborhood to Ukraine, the question, will Russia maybe uh, become the new neighbor of uh, Romania? <laughs> and insofar, please, Mr. Minister, if you uh, just present us your ideas. Well, uh, good evening. Thank you very much, Mr. Minister. I should like to extend my gratitude for having me here, and uh, I'm very grateful to you. Um, having the interest in discussing and addressing such kind of sensitive and very, very complicated issue. So I shall start from two assumptions, uh, Mr. Minister, with your permission. First of all, what is foreseeable in the future? And secondly, what about Romania to become neighbor with Russia? Okay, so um, I remember uh, Bulgarian ambassador saying in, in a in a certain moment, well, uh, what happens in the Black Sea doesn't stay in the Black Sea. Please believe me. So um, what we have there? We have two, three, <coughs> four great types of forces. First, we have democracy on its western edge, the Black Sea, I mean. We have Russian military aggression in the north part of the Black Sea. We have Chinese financial soft power to the east. And we have instability in the Middle East to the south. Looks how nice the picture seems to be where God put us. And from this point of view, 
many, many years ago, great power competitions practically prevented great power conflict. For the time being, I don't think that we are in the same situation. Because failure to compete and to demonstrate and to protect the Western free world interest in that region should be a price which may be, hopefully not, but maybe all of us were supposed to pay. Um, so from this point of view, also, I should like to share uh, with you some of the aspects. I was chief negotiator with the Russians and also with the Ukrainians. With the Ukrainians for the border, practically, Ukraine has the longest border to the west with Romania. And with the Russians, in a moment when we are in the process of becoming members of uh, NATO, because as you know, you are supposed to have good neighborly relations with direct neighbors, but also in the proximity of your country, so um, we had some pending issues regarding the border with Ukraine from Ribbentrop-Molotov agreement, and we had also some pending issues with regard to Russia from many respects. I can tell you that both negoti negotiations was extremely interesting because with Kiev, we uh, met once three times, uh, once at three weeks, and we negotiated a border which did already exist since Ribbentrop-Molotov for five years. None of us were in the position to move the border. Of course, we didn't ask one meter from the Ukrainians, or Ukrainians didn't ask one meter from us, but we still needed it five years. And also we negotiated with the Russians. The Russians, they know very well in that moment that we are in front of the wall because we are in the process of becoming members of NATO. And that type of negotiation was an interesting one. It was quite easy. It was 2003. Mr. Putin was in power since 2000. And it was quite easy to negotiate the present, also the future, but quite impossible to negotiate the past. And this is the issue which should be considered also with regard which ways and means we can get for the foreseeable future because the Russians still, they are looking very intensively to the past. And for a lawyer, well, it's a little bit quite complicated to figure out which might be the language in order to calm down the parliaments, the Romanian parliament and the State Duma in order to fulfill all the expectations with regard to the reparations for the past. And it was tough, please believe me. But, um, well, in my opinion, in order to address the consequences of this crisis, and this crisis, and also to look a little bit much more attentively to the Black Sea, we should fulfill four chapters of four categories of issues which are of utmost importance and there the free world should be extremely, extremely and profoundly and substantively coherent and in a spirit of cooperation. It is really about diplomacy, information, military and economic. Um, nowadays, Well, I don't know how many of you do you know which is trip-wired based deterrence. Trip-wired based deterrence is a sense of, and the spirit of the free world, in order to address sensitive regions and uh, particularly those regions which had a certain kind of potentials for the crisis to transform a military crisis with small military presence in order just to signal out, not to threaten, but to signal out that if this presence is not taken into account in, in a very appropriate manner, it might become a much larger one. So on the basis of this principle, um, <coughs> Practically, what we have 
in the region. We have the, I think after the falling of the Berlin Wall, we have a clear picture of the fact that taking into account interest, crisis, moments, different attitudes of the great powers, at least from our point of view, the Kremlin is prepared to use force in the Black Sea. And now they are using force in the Black Sea. But this idea, well, stemming from our assessment, is, one, is a pending issue since 1992. Because in 1992, the separatist authorities in the Moldavian region, in Transnistria, they practically declared the war. And after that war, it was a lengthy discussion in the format 5 plus 2, which remained a lengthy discussion. Still a pending issue about the sovereignty of Republic of Moldova. So it worked. It worked. Using the diplomatic or the dialogue as instruments in order to have the necessary leverage from this point of view. In 2008, uh, Russia invaded Georgia. But something else also happened in 2008. It was a summit, NATO summit in Bucharest, where Georgia and Ukraine, they wanted a certain kind of map decision. And they didn't receive it. And in summer, Georgia was invaded, and, continue, and practically Russia continues to occupy 20% of this Georgian sovereign territory, Abkhazia and South Ossetia. In 2014, Crimea was occupied. Um, in 2018, there were some vessels, some ships, which were seized by the, by the Russian forces. Um, practically, since 2014, a war was developing it was carried out in Donbass and Lugansk. I don't think that the, the, the situation is, is much more different than nowadays. Um, practically, the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe is put in the position not to fulfill its tasks. The Minsk Group and the organization, the OECE, was put in the position not to try to set a to set up a solution for Nagorno-Karabakh conflict. It was needed to have a Russian-Turkey agreement. And the multilateral capability was like it was. So <coughs> what to do? Well, uh, it was said here, and it is a reality. And I can tell you that we, in the south part, we. Um, we suffer a little bit from this point of view. We are afraid a little bit from this point of view. On, on the, uh, the <coughs> northern part of the continent, on that side, practically the Baltic Sea enjoyed considerable attention from Western security planners over the last 20 years. We don't have in the Black Sea. We didn't have in the Black Sea such kind of balance. And I, uh, I tell you, and I hope all of you know very well, Practically in the north part, and it's again a very good decision, in the north part, those fighting groups existed since some years ago. And they were capable, they were able to react immediately in case of an aggression. Basically, if you are looking to the decision of NATO, let's put the Russian aside. If we are looking to the decision of NATO, you will see that the capability and most specifically the disponibility of NATO countries to react immediately in northern part of the flank is a very clear and a very good one for the Black Sea region, the world is tailored. Please look in the decision in NATO decision in Poland is tailored. So it's a difference. Why still this difference exists now? And uh, from this point of view, at least from my point of view, not only from my point of view, also from, from the point of view of the region, the situation should be treated equally, otherwise all of us will suffer. 
practically um, in in this moment, I think also you know this interdiction. I don't know how to call it. A two A D. This naval and uh, uh, air interdiction in north part of the Black Sea was in place since 2015, 16. This interdiction means practically an aggression against Romania. Nowadays, they occupy the Serpent Island. The Serpent Island is a rock in the middle of the sea. This Serpent Island, I think uh, the distance between our shore and the Serpent Island is 35 miles, kilometers, something like that. But what about the idea that the Serpent Islands practically is in the middle of our continental shelf and economic zone? We are speaking together about the potential energy reserves which might be at the bottom of the Black Sea. Okay, who is going to explore them? <clears throat> there are more than 100 million square meters, something like that, of, of uh, gas, particularly gas. It's a resource. It is something which can be used not only by Romania, come on. It is something which can be used also by all European countries from here. But we have the Serpent, serpent Island. And that is why I'm trying to underscore a little bit the, the, the fact that if we are going to consider that it is only up to the t countries in that part of democratic European Union and Democratic Security Union to take care about such kind of issues. If, and if you are just turning your back to that situation, because from many respects, some security and stability problems should be addressed, but it is impossible to figure out a solution, it might become a problem in a certain moment which is overwhelmingly complicated than the premises. So, what I'm trying to, um, to say is that, uh, by the way, about the harbors, now everything which was, tra was trying, vessels, ships, was trying to crisscross the Black Sea going to Odessa, now is coming to Constanza. Constanza Harbor in Romania is overwhelmed. They don't have the capacity. Nowadays, when I'm speaking, uh, in order to figure out economic solutions with regard to these ships which cannot reach the Ukrainian uh, harbor. It's a fact. So from this point of view, what I want to say is we should be much more open and uh, our interest to be much more uh, put in the same basket. Because Again, as the Bulgarian ambassador has said, nothing which is happening in Black Sea remains in the Black Sea. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much. I think it was more than just interesting uh, to listen to the position, you know, not uh, from the view of a landlocked country like Austria or Slovakia uh, or Hungary, but from uh, a country that is more or less touched immediately, you know, with all those questions of the Black Sea region uh, that certainly is highly sensitive. Okay, now we have the opportunity uh, to listen to Adim Pistrinčuc uh, from Moldova. I have uh, already presented you shortly. Now we are looking forward to your short statement. Hello and good evening, everybody. Thank you very much, first of all, for inviting me to participate in the event. And I'm, I'm really sorry I couldn't attend the event uh, to Vienna. Maybe it's also one of the reasons, uh, also one of the consequences of this terrible war is that Moldova is currently under no-fly zone because of the <laughs> proximity of the military actions near Odessa and, and the rocket launches and things like that. But we hope we can come back to a normal existence 
soon. So I would like to speak a few words maybe about the consequences of the war on the, on the, at the current stage in Moldova. First of all, I'd like to tell you that in, in my memory and a bit of knowledge of the, since the independence of the country and, and my experience being part of a couple of governments uh, in Moldova, I didn't see such an um, overlap of crisis in our country. First of all, it's humanitarian. Per capita, Moldova takes uh, most of the refugees. I know the number, the absolute numbers are not so high like in Poland or other countries, but per capita, Moldova is a small country. It's, it's, for us, it's a, it's a big uh, figure. But, but I'm very proud of, of uh, my um, society because three, four, uh, two-thirds of the refugees are staying in households, in families of Moldovans, which is a very good indicator about, you know, a small country with a big heart. The second biggest challenge, of course, uh, we have two neighbors. We have uh, Ukraine and, and our modern neighbor, motherland, Romania. But uh, economically, uh, speaking about imports and exports, most of them uh, were going through Ukraine, via Ukraine, and, and the port of uh, Chernomorsk and Odessa. And you can imagine that that uh, has a huge impact on, um, on our exports, imports, on the logistics, and uh, finally on the prices, uh, on, on the goods and competitivity and so on. Uh, the third crisis is, of course, about the energy. Uh, we are totally in, dependent on, on the Russian gas, although we did substantial efforts to have a pipeline that connects us with Romania, and we use that in, in, in this winter during the, um, uh, uh, dur during uh, this winter energetic crisis. Uh, Mm, and all together, all together, this put a lot of pressure on, on our financial system and uh, inflation is over 20% and so on. And of course, nonetheless, is the security issue. Yes, we are a neutral country according to our constitution. And uh, although it was a disputable uh, point in our constitution, but still now it is a very important thing. Although we don't know who is... Uh, the warrant who is guaranteeing our our neutrality and of course this neutrality is also under question because of Transnistria and there are Russian troops uh, although they had the commitment in 1999 to withdraw the troops from there so it's um, it's a pretty critical situation uh, for for my country but still the atmosphere is is stable although in the society there is a big level of alert and, and fears but all that is channeled into you know helping ukraine and ukrainian refugees that are still coming to Moldova. and of course the flow will be much higher if uh, things will develop in a in a tragic way in the region of odessa so just to compare the population of Odessa is comparable to the population of, of Odessa Oblast. Yes, is comparable to the population of the Republic of Moldova. That's about uh, Moldova, but <clears throat> I'd like to speak a bit about the topic uh, of our conference, of our meeting, and uh, what's next, how will Europe, its neighborhood, uh, exist uh, after, after this war, but it's early I think to say that it is after. First of all it's important to our from, from my perspective to understand what happened and why it happened. Um, it is more than a war in Ukraine that happens now. Uh, we totally agree with that because um, the only thing on which we can uh, discuss and analyze what happened is the speech of uh, Putin before the invasion, just immediately. And if you look to that speech, and you understand, then he pointed clearly that he targets not Ukraine only as a territory, but also the Western way of, of the Western uh, governance model, yes, the democratic system and so on. He pointed out, and there is a quote even, do you feel much better uh, addressing to Ukrainians uh, in a democratic, in, in this democracy, with all these NGOs, human rights, and things like that. So, what is important 
from our point of view, and we have, you know, we are bilingual, most of us, we, we read the, the Russian sources, <coughs> Ukrainian sources, uh, all, all the sources, and uh, we feel that um, to some extent the West is missing some of the, of the signs sent by Putin. For example, we are not clear, uh, we are not sure and clear about is he going to stop here? Are the sanctions going to stop him at this point? Is this a sign given tomorrow, uh, sorry, uh, this sign that was sent yesterday, is the real sign or is just regrouping and things like that? So because what he really, um, if, if you look through uh, Russian channels, analysts, uh, some of them are still in Moscow or in Russia, some of them are a few away, uh, you understand that, um, and the discourse of the uh, Russian official propaganda you understand that the mood in the society and within the leadership in, in Kremlin is not about stopping the war. It's about going till the end. Uh, how did we get here? I mean, I think that we all have been too optimistic. I don't say only about EU, uh, also about people in my country, maybe in other countries, maybe, maybe some of political actors in Ukraine. We all thought that it is, it is impossible. Although where there were analysts in Russia and public persons that were clearly indicating that something is going to happen, a big war is going to happen. Why? The explanation is very simple, because he got used to the so-called, in Russian, say, silovy решения, which means uh, the power, uh, the, the, the power based solution for, for some war. There was 2008 Georgia, then Syria, then 2014, Crimea, and so on, and everywhere uh, when he needed a uh, geopolitical gain, the power of military has been used. And that is uh, that is a thing that we somehow miscalculate. We should also ask ourselves about uh, lax and pretty weak uh, sanctions after 2014. Uh, we should also think and question ourselves about energy issue because uh, oil and gas is still the most important um, how to say economic and financial uh, source for uh, for the Russian economy and for Russian state uh, I don't want to blame anybody because we are also in the situation to be uh, to deal with that but that poses some questions uh, for the future of Europe because it is clear that uh, at this stage, um, it is uh, it's a huge European tragedy, so it, it will affect all of us. It will affect the life of all Europeans, but it's not clear how ready we are and how ready are the Europeans, the EU countries, to um, realize that they have to lose something in order to gain more stability or the former stability. Because, look, yesterday, for example, I did a small exercise uh, after some warming was announced during the negotiations and I did an exercise trying to look through the Russian media and social networks and you know um, what uh, struck me and I, I became very sad about it but I knew that it would happen the Russian uh, society through different comments and and like ordinary people starting regretting that you know the troops uh, the Russian troops are withdrawing from Kiev region, saying, no, we didn't subscribe for that. We want till the end, they call it. We want to go till the end. And a lot of you know, military analysts that are serving the Putin regime, and so on, they were saying the same thing. So if we thought that the sanctions will change the course of um, uh, the thinking, of the collective thinking of the Russian society, it didn't happen. Um, I know that uh, there is difficult to do a sociology research in, in, in a dictatorship country, in you know, an authoritarian uh, regime, but, mm -hmm. you know, even the Russian uh, journalist, analyst, the exiled one, they remarked that, uh, you know, m most of the people who are in Russia now um, are totally dominated, almost totally, almost totally dominated by the Russian propaganda. It means that he has the support of a very important part of his society to go ahead with the war, regardless big losses. 
And, and you have a lot of, of video proofs for that and, and reports and, and analysis from the ground. Um, uh, well, there is another um, thing that goes as a pervasive line through all the discourses of the Russian propaganda, which says that it is not a, a war just against uh, Ukraine, as they say, against the, uh, the Nazis in Ukraine, which is very strange, having a, a Jewish uh, president and many other things. I mean, it's incredible, this uh, propaganda, but it has been taken and it penetrated pretty well uh, the Russian society. But this pervasive line is that we do not fight just a war against Ukraine, it is a war against the West and a war against NATO or US and EU. Today, uh, uh, Mr. Um, um, uh, today, Mr. the head of uh, party group, Mironov, Mr. Mironov has already made a, a public uh, statement saying that we have to introduce and to consider the Russians to consider to consider EU as an anti-Russian organization and even stop selling to them the gas and the oil supplies. I know it, it is it sounds a little bit crazy because they need of this money, but I will never exclude anything in that conditions because for Putin apparently it is fair, it will be very difficult to withdraw from there because, uh, uh, I don't know, uh, the losses for them don't count. They have big losses, they have uh, to bury many soldiers, but still he is not uh, accountable in front of his society. He built a society that he, uh, he needed, a, a loyal and obedient society. Uh, after 24th of February, most of the critical parts of the society, you know, the youngsters, the, the IT and tech workers, uh, the creative industry, they all flew away to Erevan, Tbilisi, some of them to European countries. So he has now a totally, a mostly obedient society. So I don't see what changes will happen in that <clears throat> regard in the nearest future. Okay. Another, um, uh, yes, we, we, we all understood that Putin committed a miscalculation. He probably confused the, the military camera. strategy the with, is a, there. Yeah. So maybe. Sorry, with a political <laughs> strategy, but in the same time, he can afford, uh, you know, losing people again because of lack of any, um, how to say, transparency in front of his society. So if somebody is thinking that because of the huge economic losses or uh, of, uh, you know, human losses in the war in Ukraine, he would redo his strategy somehow, I would not be so optimistic because Russians and in that construction, in that political construction, he can afford of losing more people. He can afford of putting his, his population on a very, uh, to say, on a uh, strict uh, diet, uh, making them, you know, lose uh, businesses or jobs, but keeping floating the country and, and feeding uh, further the military machine. So nobody knows how it will go after. There are a lot of signs in the Russian media that they have to go further and they have to hit also the channels of delivering weapons to Ukraine because they consider this uh, as a, a very important thing. So we don't know what will happen. Of course, we can rely on some information, intelligence, but apparently He's cornered and he uh, is looking for some bold, you know, end or bold uh, uh, development of the situation. And we can't know what that will be. How will be the future of Europe? Mm, I, I think that you know better as genuine Europeans. Uh, we in the neighborhood um, mm, trying to keep our optimism, but uh, from a side, it's seen, you know, I don't know what to say how it will be because the war is not over the war uh, you know it, every day of this war bring more refugees more crises can bring uh, you know can push parts of this uh, war and to some incredible deeds so but we can uh, you know discuss some of the questions uh, which can shape the future of europe in the future of course we all have seen uh, an exemplary uh, um alignment of all European countries during uh, this war on the sanctions and other things. But 
first, we, I think that Europeans have to decide for themselves where, was, where did they do the mistake, uh, why uh, the sanctions in 2014 has been so, la so relaxed, I would say, and easy um, uh, for Russians. Um, how can we think that, uh, you know, uh, buying a lot of energy resources from Russia and, and that money, this money goes to modernization. And we have a lot of already examples that showed us that, you know, they like this silovoy reshenia, these power methods and military methods in solving the geopolitical uh, disputes. How are we going to do it in the future? And the most important question that I think that will, will, will shape Europe's future is to ask um, ourselves how much are we ready to lose and that's especially about the European countries although there everybody is in line but we still see some differences and, and, and that is absolutely okay because all European countries are democracies and it's a democratic club and you have to take care of your political environment and very often say what your people want to hear rather than to lead into the direction that you have to lead but I think, uh, I, I, maybe because of my geographical position, I see the situation in much more darker colors um, because uh, it is a war against part of European civilization. <clears throat> of course, he, they would like to have a very, uh, you know, obedient European Union or uh, neighbors. Of course, countries like Moldova might be a target for them, although we get reassurances from our strategic partners that uh, we are not a part of their military plans. But it is the crucial, the cornerstone uh, uh, question is how much every European leader uh, or um, citizen is ready to lose. Because uh, this war is, is too big, the tragedy is too big to be forgotten or to, you know, make a, a short peace and say, let's, you know, stop and cancel some sanctions little by little and everything will become okay. You know, I think that um, this is a challenge for entire Europe. And of course, the next point, uh, what will be already is, 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 is changing, is the security of Europe. States will start, uh, you know, militarizing even more, uh, weaponizing, uh, and, and here I think a big challenge that that should be a pan-European, uh, um, a pan-European, uh, a European, a collective European solution. So, thank you. Uh, the most important thing is how much... If you, are we if you tell us your last, your last sentence, please. <clears throat> I have to look at the time. Uh, if you are so nice, please. Yeah. So that, that was my last sentence. You already said. Uh, <laughs> get the stability and the peace that we all want. Uh, we need to think about what we are ready to sacrifice and lose. Thank you. Thank you very much for your statement. Okay. Yeah, we are getting many views, and of course, uh, this is challenging also for everybody because we still have one presenter and I'm looking forward to it because he really is familiar with the Ukrainian question and maybe he also can give us a little bit of an Austrian, uh, not position, but a, an Austrian point of view or out of an Austrian experience. Please, Ambassador Seidig. Well, uh, thank you very much. Uh, Christian Merschütz uh, already said that I will probably address the question of uh, neutrality and uh, the issue of uh, guarantees, security guarantees. But uh, allow me to make a personal remark uh, at the beginning. Um, I was uh, in Moscow for a week, just uh, uh, two weeks before uh, the 24th of February. And uh, in the conversations that I had in Moscow, I sensed a lot of anger against Ukraine, against the uh, Ukrainian interlocutors in the Minsk talks, and uh, some real negative positions. But I returned with the conviction 
that there will be no war and uh, that uh, they will not uh, underestimate uh, the role of Ukraine, the strength of Ukraine, and that uh, they will think beyond uh, what can be afterwards. And I was, like many, many others, completely wrong. And, uh, but many of the interlocutors that I met, most probably themselves, although they had some very some special closeness to the ruling circles, but they themselves probably did not expect uh, this type of development. Uh, and that was a an, an, you know, very interesting uh, situation of mine. So this is a personal remark at the beginning, and now let me make some uh, observations on, as Christian Jaschutz uh, said, on the issues of uh, the discussions on Ukraine's neutrality, the security guarantees, and uh, the question of referendum. Uh, Ukraine has accepted that it will become a neutral country, but it hasn't said which neutrality. Uh, it hasn't said whether this will be an Austrian neutrality, a Finnish neutrality, a Swiss neutrality, uh, or a Turkmen neutrality. Turkmenistan has also its own neutrality. They didn't say so. Uh, and they uh, did not make a choice. But what they were talking about uh, from the very beginning was that uh, any declaration of Ukrainian neutrality must be fixed in an agreement and it must be accompanied by security guarantees. So that is a big international agreement and I think that Russia uh, basically thinks the same way. A big international agreement uh, with uh, neutrality and security guarantees together. That reminds us of the Swiss neutrality, of the original Swiss neutrality of uh, uh, November uh, 1815 uh, in the second Paris Peace. We have this type of a construction uh, history, uh, but we can also uh, try to uh, sell them the Austrian neutrality uh, or uh, the Finnish form, uh, which would be a different one. But then, uh, as we know with the Austrian neutrality, this doesn't mean that this would be an international agreement. Uh, and uh, if the Russians want this international agreement uh, with security guarantees, then it is not only security guarantees by Russia itself, and as much as Ukrainians then will believe and trust in these security guarantees, but security guarantees from many other countries, including the US, including France, uh, including uh, China, P5, uh, and also other countries beyond. So this will be, an, if this is the uh, way they look at it, this means that this will be an extremely difficult negotiation. Because this is not a bilateral issue between uh, Ukraine and Russia, as Russia might like to have it, uh, with a lot of restrictions on Ukrainian sovereignty through a demilitarized Ukraine and uh, neutrality uh, according to what Russia believes should be a neutrality, but it would be an international agreement. And uh, that means to uh, have all the lawyers, the American lawyers, the, uh, the French lawyers, and it would be a huge agreement, like the agreement was in 1815. And by the way, in 1815, Swiss neutrality uh, then was guaranteed by the Tsarist Empire. Uh, so that would be an interesting continuity. Uh, and uh, uh, if it is not an, absurd, an absurdity in history. Uh, so uh, here we have to be also very clear. The security guarantees would also, uh, what is also aimed at is that this agreement will be ratified. Ratified by the Duma, by the Rada, uh, but also by the 
Senate, by Assemblée Nationale, you name it. And the Ukrainians also think that the neighboring countries should be part of this, uh, they should also be security guarantors, uh, including also as a neighboring country in the Black Sea, Turkey. Uh, so that will be, again, imagine what that means, what kind of negotiations this will entail, and uh, whether the Russians then, when they thought about this, uh, and having uh, a Ukrainian neutrality, whether uh, they uh, understand what it means to get at these international security guarantees. <clears throat> uh, that will be definitely a very difficult issue. And the Western countries will probably bring up the question of reparation. Uh, for uh, the, the Russians will have to you know, pay reparations. And I guess the Ukrainians would bring this up too. So imagine uh, to tackle this question of reparation in, an, in, in a big international agreement. Right or wrong? Another issue that has to be tackled there would be amnesty. Uh, there is, in the Minsk agreements, that I had uh, the pleasure uh, for uh, four and a half years to try to implement them uh, in Minsk, uh, we have the issue of amnesty in this there. And uh, so the issue of amnesty will come up for what kind of things? <clears throat> uh, what, what about you know, uh, international uh, criminal law, uh, transitional justice? Will we tackle this issue or not? Um, huge question, but the question of amnesty will have to be solved, as well as the question of exchange of detainees. Missing persons, thousands of missing persons. Uh, issues that have to be uh, definitely tackled. Uh, and uh, we have also dealt with the issue of missing persons only uh, in, in relationship to the Donbass, and I can tell you what a difficult uh, issue this is. Uh, so all this will be and has to be tackled within uh, in a big international agreement. EU membership of Ukraine. The Russians said, yes, we can imagine uh, that uh, Ukraine can become a member of the European Union. But will the Russians accept that the European Union with, you know, in theory, a member Ukraine will ever uh, adopt another sanctions against Russia? Or will the Russians try uh, to have a clause in the agreement that uh, prohibits Ukraine to uh, vote for sanctions against Russia? I.e., you have a Trojan horse in the European Union. Uh, will this be something uh, that we can uh, live with all uh, and uh, with this type of agreement. Uh, just, just some points that I'm trying to make and some question marks that I put. The other issue is that uh, Zelensky has said uh, this all has to be uh, implemented only on the basis of a referendum in Ukraine. A referendum where in which parts of Ukraine? Uh, can we give an answer to this question now? Certainly not. And uh, as we heard from uh, our uh, previous speaker in, uh, uh, from, from Moldova, the, the, and also from, uh, from Minister Yakonescu, uh, what does it mean when the Russians try to extend uh, their uh, uh, grasp until up to uh, the uh, Danube. Uh, what kind of Ukraine will there be left? So the, the question will be, uh, what will be the answer uh, for where will be a referendum held? So another uh, very, very difficult question. Let, let me make another observation. Uh, 
what is interesting about the present talks is that these talks are without mediation. Uh, the Turks, as far as I can see it, are not the mediators of the talks. They are the organizers of the talks, but they're not the mediators in the talks. Uh, so uh, I, they just talk directly. Uh, and each side comes home with its own narrative of the result of the negotiations. And uh, they, uh, there is no you know, draft and uh, contents and no mediator to present <coughs> any kind of uh, you know, possible document. And we don't know on which basis they are now negotiating, for instance, the issue of neutrality. And uh, we can assume that the Russians have made some sort of a homework before, uh, but uh, whether this uh, is really in line with what ever can be accepted in the future is something else. Uh, so here, again, many open questions. Negotiations without mediation, where do they uh, get at? Where do they lead to? Uh, I know this because I was the mediator, and I can tell you that uh, our role was definitely uh, was really necessary. Can the OEC, as uh, Mr. Uh, Minister uh, uh, Stara uh, spoke about the OEC, can the OEC again take the role of a mediator? Uh, we have the ideas of who, who can be mediators, the Turks, the Chinese, God knows who. Yes, sir. Uh, but uh, we, we haven't found any media updater up to now. And to believe that the Chinese, with its policy of not uh, traveling uh, and uh, waiting for the next party congress, uh, can ever perform a role of a mediator, I don't see that. You have to be on the ground, you have to shuttle, uh, and you have to bring the people together. Uh, so uh, who will be the mediator? There can be outside mediation by professional mediators. Uh, the UN, the ICRC. But the problem is that both the UN and the ICRC uh, have at the moment in Ukraine a relatively bad reputation. And uh, the photograph of uh, the uh, head of the ICRC, Mr. Maurer, uh, when he was in Moscow, uh, shaking hands with Lavrov and laughing, uh, didn't go very well in Kiev. Uh, so uh, that is another of these issues that we have to see. Yes, uh, the UN now has a very experienced uh, uh, possible mediator, Martin Griffith, who is the head of OCHA and who is one of the you know, really experienced mediators before he joined OCHA. Uh, but uh, whether the uh, Russians would accept uh, a British uh, mm. a gentleman like uh, Martin uh, Griffiths uh, is uh, to be uh, questioned. So here, uh, this question is really open. If we watched uh, yesterday's uh, news on uh, the negotiations in, uh, in, in Istanbul, uh, there was something that I, an aspect that I found interesting. Uh, one could feel from the Russian reaction that I would say for the first time the Russians showed respect to the Ukrainian side. Uh, and uh, that is, if it were true, an interesting development. Uh, they have enough reason for them to uh, have respect. And uh, that they finally, not only the, as we know how they have uh, you know, acted uh, in the conflict itself. Uh, whether this then transpires up to the top and Mr. Putin will have respect to the comedian Zelensky, <laughs> let's see. Uh, he has not respected him so far. Uh, maybe he will be changing his attitude but what we have seen up to now is certainly not uh, the term respect. But yesterday, 
we for the first time could observe some respect from the Russian side uh, for uh, the Ukrainians and the Ukrainian position. What can that bring in Ukraine? As we have always said that the Russians are the victim, victims of their own narratives. I used to say in an interview uh, in, uh, in the Austrian radio four weeks ago, uh, I spoke, let me now use this term uh, in, in German or in, in Austrian, I spoke of the autoinfektion am eigenen Schmäh, uh, so, uh, which is the, the autoinfection uh, on your own propaganda, uh, in, in better terminology. Uh, and uh, so, uh, but the Russians can be autoinfected, uh, but let's not forget that also the Ukrainians can be. Because the Ukrainians now can say, oh, we are strong. We have been able to fight. So there is also a, a danger for them to get auto-infected by their own shmei, uh, by their own uh, propaganda. And this would be uh, also a uh, very interesting development that we have to see. One question that we have not tackled and we have not discussed here is how do we Europeans uh, deal with the role of Belarus in this crisis? Uh, this is put aside. But the question eventually will have to be answered. Uh, the role of Belarus uh, in this uh, crisis, in this conflict. Uh, and uh, how do we, there are, uh, there were some sanctions now on Belarus, but how do we further proceed? Uh, and uh, we should not forget this. Uh, you know, we should not forget to think also about Belarus and how do we deal with this. The problem of Belarus is, by all means, not over. Uh, and uh, how do we uh, uh, deal with their role that they have had? Uh, that is open. Uh, Mr. Stare spoke about the many uh, you know, international aspects. And I think uh, they, uh, I mean, this was exhaustive. Uh, let me just uh, allow, allow myself to uh, have another uh, international aspect that I would like to add and that we should not overlook also in the context of this crisis. This is climate change. Uh, the issue of climate change we will have to discuss and we, it will continue, it will be our, it will be at the topic here uh, without any question. But Europe will have a reorientation of its uh, energy policies and uh, will have to uh, deal with this issue. Uh, and uh, climate, the issue of climate change uh, is on the agenda. <coughs> we are far from having solved the issue of climate change. And uh, so we will have to deal with this. And this is also an issue for us Austrians with the present government that we have, uh, with the Greens in the government. Uh, how do we see this the issue of climate change and the future energy policy? Uh, and climate change is also a question in Russia. Russia has undergone uh, in the last two years what they call in Russia a green revolution. Uh, and they have adopted new laws uh, under the you know, influence of uh, the forest fires uh, in uh, the tundra, permafrost. Last summer, 40,000 square kilometers for forest fires. This summer, they will have some other forest fires. The Russians will have to deal with this. And the Russians will have to deal with this issue, uh, and they cannot do it without any outside technology. And the technology cannot only come from China. Uh, the Russians need this. Unfortunately, the main advocate in Russia on climate change issues has left the country. Uh, Anatoly Chubais, uh, who was the special advisor of Putin <coughs> in the Kremlin on climate change issues. Uh, he has left. But the issue of climate change with the departure of Chubais is not gone. 
the issue of climate change will be there and it will be pressing for Russia again uh, in the summer to come. So we have to be also aware of this and we have to uh, see this also in the wider context uh, that we have to also think about Russia and its problems with climate change when we tackle these issues. Uh, our landmass, European, Asian landmass is indiv indivisible geographically. And uh, we have to think about Russia in this context uh, by all means too. And now, finally, let me make uh, uh, another uh, personal remark. I started with a personal remark and I will end with a personal remark. Uh, we have taken uh, two, we have taken a Ukrainian family uh, living with us. And uh, they uh, came in two uh, 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 different steps. Uh, first, uh, they went through Slovakia. First part of the family through Slovakia. And the second part of the family went through Hungary. And they were uh, extremely positive how well uh, this transit was organized in your two countries. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. I think we uh, have not got only a lesson on the complexity of the Ukrainian uh, challenge, but uh, also a lesson on the complexity of diplomacy. This insights for everybody uh, who is interested, I mean, in resolving international uh, problems. This insight certainly was a contribution that uh, one cannot forget easily, because you can see that for some people, maybe some solution is very easy and lying more or less at the table, but if you uh, look a little bit closer, uh, you can realize how difficult it is to get a real solution out of it. So, thank you so much. Uh, we have finished our usual uh, time of two hours. Unfortunately, I would have loved to discuss, of course, the questions also with the audience. Uh, I will not do it because this would take us too much of the time. And uh, the challenge certainly is very complex. And insofar, I just will try to end. Short comment of uh, our presenters, uh, maybe to the others, just a statement of one or two sentences. Uh, and maybe I, I start <laughs> with the State Secretary. I should be uh, the last one. <laughs> but OK, uh, there's, a, there's a joke. <clears throat> The, about about the three uh, aspects or three type of approaches to security policy. And the fir first one is the optimist who uh, learns English. The second one is uh, the pessimist who learns Chinese. And the third one is the realist who exercises the use of hand weapons. And I I make the joke sometimes, but now. After this, I will never ever cite this joke because I see that it is true. It happened in our neighborhood in a very tragic way. And the problem is that, as I said, this may inspire others in the future. Okay. Thank you. And thank you once again for coming, even uh, if you have such a highly dense program also at home. Okay. Uh, Maybe, Mr. Minister, if you... Uh... Well, Mr. Minister, thank you very much. Maybe one of the ideas, I don't know how can be implemented and how, can, how far can we go from this point of view, is that nobody in international relations can act having in mind impunity. If someone will be considered that he is above the law, meaning the national law, the international law, the moral law, the political law, things like this is happening and the situation could be much, much more complicated in order to try to restore the peaceful situation at the very beginning, irrespective of the fact that that peaceful situation was the basis of the political rhetoric in order to avoid to address the problem and those who are provoking that problem. Thank you very much. Yeah.
Yeah, thank you so much. And maybe as our last foreign speaker. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, two remarks. The first is devoted to the ambassador, your intervention for me. It was e extremely interesting, maybe because I have no experience with diplomacy. And all these nuances are fantastic, but my impression is that it is too early to speculate about neutrality and all relevant issues, because it is too early. I feel very strongly that in two months, everything will be different, could be different. I am preparing myself for a long journey. And the second remark, I was very, I was, I, I was struck a lot by our Moldovian colleague. It was depressing to one extent, but very realistic to the other one. And he, he stated that um, uh, a lot depends on the EU and our ability or willingness to lose, he said, yeah? And I was writing on my paper, how much are we ready, willing to suffer from the issue? And this is my conviction. You know, I am a marathon runner. If you need to run 42 kilometers, believe me, you will suffer. The second half of the, of the race is I incredibly difficult. Even 21 is enough. <laughs> and I can understand the guy from Moldova. This will decide who is able to suffer more. We will suffer three. Ukraine, Russia, the EU. The winner must be able to suffer the most. Maybe it is a bit melodramatic, but again, I am preparing myself, my fellow citizens, my family, my friends, to be able to suffer because I do not believe that there is a possible compromise with Mr. Putin. Believe me, I know him. We have to win. Yeah. yeah, thank you so much. Uh, I want to come to an end. I really want to thank our speakers and presenters for their coming, uh, for their analysis. Certainly, we all have to learn, and nobody has a recipe. There is, will be no simple solution. And we experienced already some surprises. Probably everybody experienced surprises. Even Zelensky did not expect that there could be such an invasion. The Russians had the surprise about Ukrainian resilience. They underestimated it completely. They also overestimated their capability to perform militarily. And this was not the first time this was already the second time after Nagorno-Karabakh. Insofar, it is the Russian self-understanding that suffered already. Do not underestimate it. And maybe I do not want to uh, go further on. But I think there will be no winner at the end, not even China. Because they are already in a, quite an alliance, Russia and China. And I'm sure that it will not be easy to have a weakened ally from the Beijing side. Insofar, OK, let's look forward. Let's work on it. Let's try to find a solution to help the people and to, f to come to an end of this uh, immediate war. And to discuss already further on what will be the developments, not only for the moment, but in the long run, what will it mean to our systems? And I would say, okay, let's start immediately after the end now. We uh, want to invite you for a glass of wine. And there you can discuss also uh, perspectives that go <laughs> further into the future 
uh, as we can see it now. Thank you so much uh, for your interest and for your audience. Thank you.